Okay. Now, as I said last week, the book of Lamentations, it, it consists of five poems, each of which is an expression of grief over the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 587-586 uh, B.C. So you have these, these poems that are expressing this grief over that conquest and destruction. And to properly appreciate the book, at least my judgment is, is that to do that, you, you have to have some appreciation of the history that led to the judgment that is mourned in that book. Because if you just parachute into the book and you're looking at it and say, boy, these people are really suffering, you need, you need the backstory. You need to see what God has done and to understand how, how clearly and repeatedly God told the people of Israel this is how it is. This is how it will be. You, you need to be faithful and loyal and there will be blessing and glory and all that. But if you turn your back on me, if you disrespect me and treat me like I'm not God, well then it's going to be a terrible suffering for you. So it's your choice, blessing or curse. And so he tells them that and we have to see that. And so I'm taking us on a chronological journey of God's relationship with Israel up to that great day of punishment. And as I say, I want you to see how clearly and repeatedly he expresses himself. And I also want you to see how patient God has been. I mean, to me, it's just mind-blowing how patient God has been in the face of nearly constant rebellion. As he takes them out and says, now listen, this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to be. And here they are. At, 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 decade, century, century, at, at. And then finally, God says, destruction. It's coming. Okay, he tells them, we saw last week that the, the Israelites, they began grumbling and complaining about their circumstances very soon after their great deliverance by God from slavery in Egypt. God tells them in Exodus that if they will obey his voice and keep his covenant, they will be blessed, and they soon engage in idolatry. He tells them repeatedly in Leviticus that if they're faithful to him, they'll be blessed in the new land, but if they're disloyal to him, they'll be brutalized by a foreign invader. He tells them that. In Numbers, the Israelites continue grumbling and complaining. They rebel against the idea of conquering the promised land. And they again engage in idolatry with Baal of Peor. So here they are, you know, grumble, complain, idolatry. This is before we get into the, into the promised land. So they're doing this. Uh, in Deuteronomy, on the eve of their entrance into the promised land, you know, east of the Jordan, Moses tells them, he, he just tells them over and over that they will be blessed if they're faithful to God and cursed if they're not and he insists that they work to keep that truth fresh, not only in their minds, but in the minds of their children. This has to be transmitted generationally, because this is so important. You have to remember this. You can't afford to allow this truth and this reality to lapse from your cultural knowledge, because it's that important. It's, you know, it's serious. So you must, you must keep this fresh in your mind. And you must transmit this to your children. And soon after the people crossed over into the promised land, we saw Achan rebelled against the command of the Lord. Then Joshua read to all the people all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, giving it to them again, make sure that they have this. And then near the end of his life, he charged the people to be faithful to God or else they would be removed from the land. He tells them that. And then at Shechem, he had the people pledge anew their commitment to God. You remember, listen, this is how it is. This is who God is. This is what he's called. This is the deal. Blessings, curse. Blessings, curse. What's it going to be? Oh, we're going to follow God. All right. Remember that. Know that. Understand that. Now, the period when judges ruled, when they ruled in Israel, it commenced not long after the death of, of Joshua. You see in Judges chapter 1, verse 1, which one can reasonably estimate occurred around 1366. You can always argue about some of these things. But that's a reasonable estimate of when Joshua would have died. So let's say from 1366, and it ends with the anointing of Saul as the first king 
around 1051 B.C. 1366, 1051, this is the period of the judges. So we're talking about 315-year period. Now, repeatedly throughout those centuries... Here they come into the promised land, they have some victories, Joshua dies, not long after that we have the period of the judges, several centuries, and what's happening then? Repeated rebellion against God. Judges chapter 2, verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Judges chapter 3, verse 7, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Judges 3.12, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 4.1, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Judges 6.1, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Judges 10.6, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. <laughs> well, you know, this is God. This is God. And what is he doing? He's bearing with their rebellion. This is the God we serve. He's bearing with their rebellion. Judges chapter 13, 1, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Judges 19, 23, And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Judges 20, verse 3, now the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah, and the people of Israel said, tell us, how did this evil happen? Judges chapter 20, 12 and 13, the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, what evil is this that has taken place among you? Now therefore, give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. So what do you see over and over? Idolatry, idolatry, rebellion, sin, not caring about God, not submitting to God, not taking God serious, not saying, whoa, you can't do that. We're the people of God. You can't live that way and treat God like that. What, are you crazy? That's like, we live how we want. We're going to live how we want. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. The people asked Samuel to appoint for them a king like the other nations had. The Lord says to Samuel in verses 7 and 8, Obey the voice of the people in all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. So he says, from the time I brought them out. You remember Moses said that? Right there on the eve of going in, he said, you've been rebellious from Jump Street. From the time I brought you out until now. Well, now where are we? We're centuries down the road. And what does God say to them? He says, you know, that that you have been, you know, you've rebelled against me. You've acted this way. They've rejected me being king over them according to all the deeds they've done. From the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. You say, they really do that? Well, I just read to you in Judges. Right? I read to you when they come in. What do they do? Well, yeah, they did. How could they do that? They did. That's how they treated God. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. Samuel tells the people, If you will fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, if both you and the King who reigns over you will follow the Lord God, it will be well. If you'll do this, if you'll be serious, if you'll be surrendered, if you'll be broken, if you'll take God seriously, if you will give him his due as God, you'll be blessed. It'll be really great, it'll be good. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. So what's he telling them? He's telling them the same thing he's been telling them throughout. Loyalty faithfulness, submission to me, blessing, rebellion, 
abhorring my regulations, my rules, my commands, curse. You'll be taken out. Now, the kings of the nation, they included many rebellious people who helped to lead, rebellious individuals who helped to lead the people astray. We're going to go through these guys. Okay? As I said, this is part, partly history lesson. So I hope it at least helps strengthen your grasp of the history of the people of Israel. But you have, you know, they ask for a king. They want to have one. Okay, you can have a king. And so we see the kings. What do they do? Well, no, okay, now it's going to be the time where uh, Israel finally gets its act together and gives God his due and is a faithful, God-honoring people. Yeah, were it only so. You see, we have the first king, Saul. He had his kingship and his family dynasty. His personal kingship and his family dynasty, his family's right to rule. He had that stripped from him because of disobedience. You see that in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15. He even slaughtered the priests at Nob in pursuit of David. Right? He goes and slaughters the priests there in 1 Samuel chapter 22. Now the second king, so Saul is the first king. He loses his kingship and his dynasty because of disobedience. Then we have the second king, King David, and he's a great king, but even he had a serious lapse, right? In taking Uriah's, Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and then arranging to have Uriah killed in battle? Well, that's a very dishonorable thing to do. You see it in 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapters 11 12. Well, then we have David's son, Solomon. He failed to follow the Lord as David had done. So we have Saul. We have David, a great king, but with lapse, with a serious lapse. Then we have David's son, Solomon. And Solomon doesn't follow the Lord as David had done. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 through 11 says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn your heart after, other, after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built the high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods, and the Lord was angry with Solomon. Because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, since, you, since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. So here we have now just rank idolatry. What has God said to the people? Over and over and over, as plainly as it can be said, I am God, I have delivered you, I will bless you, but you must be faithful to me. you got to be faithful to me. I, I want to bless you. I love you, I want to bless you, but you cannot spit on me. I am God and you cannot treat me that way. You see, you cannot treat me like I'm a dog. You must honor me because I am God. I have made the heavens and earth. All I'm seeking is what is properly, rightfully given to me because of who I am. And so what do they do? Now here we have Solomon turning away. After Solomon's death in 931, Israel, of course, divides. You have the, in the northern kingdom of Israel in keeping with what God told Solomon. He dies, 931 B.C. We can get the... The division, so we have the northern kingdom of Israel, and then we have the southern kingdom of Judah. Now Jerusalem, of course, is, is in Judah, and that's where the descendants of David continued to rule. And the judgment that is the subject of the book of Lamentations, that deals with Jerusalem, so I'm going to focus on that. 
All I'll say about the northern kingdom is that none of its kings were good. See, none of the kings of the northern kingdom were good, and they were judged by God through the Assyrian conquest. Right In 722, 721 B.C., the Assyrians finish off the northern kingdom of Israel when they capture Samaria. So they're taken out because they were constantly rebellious. None of their kings are good, so they're taken off the board by the Assyrians. Now, 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 21 to 24. So we've got Saul, David, Solomon. Now we have Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and it says of him, Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old and began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah, the Ammonite, and Judah, and, and Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed more than all that their fathers had done. More than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars and asherim on every hill and under every green tree. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Now, what would you expect God to do? What had God said to them? I'm driving these people out. They they commit abominations. You shall not do that. If you do that, you will be driven out. Ah, go on. He's just talking. You don't have to listen to him. Words. Okay? Okay? So you see how they're, in 1 Kings 15, says of Rehoboam, son of Abijah, also known as Abijah, you get that a lot with these names. But Abijah or Abijah, it says, now in the 18th year of King Rehoboam, the son of Nebat, Abijah began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom, and he walked in all the sins that his, that his father did before him. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. All the sins that his father did before, and what we just read there, they were doing all the abominations of the nations that he'd driven out. And here we have this son. Well, after two good kings, we have Asa and Jehoshaphat, who are good kings. Jehoram ruled in Judah for eight years in the middle of the ninth century. So the middle of the ninth century, 850 B.C., somewhere right around in the middle there. We have Jehoram ruling for eight years in the middle of the ninth century. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 18 says of Jehoram, and he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Not Judah. You remember? Division. Kings of Israel. All of them were bad. When he says they walk, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So how are things faring under the kings? Bad. Bad. Jehoram's son, Ahaziah, reigned as king of Judah for only one year. 2 Kings 8, 26, 27 says of him, Ahaziah was 22 years old. He began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah. She was the granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel. One of these guys. Omri, king of Israel. He also walked in the way of the house of Ahab, Israelite king, evil guy. He walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done, for he was son-in-law to the house of Ahab. So what do we have here? We have this king acting horribly. After Ahaziah was killed, his mother, this isn't how this works. The mother doesn't become queen, but this is what happens. After he's killed, his mother usurped the throne, killing all the potential rivals in the royal family. She slaughters the royal family so she can be queen. Well, that sounds very God-honoring, very wholesome. She missed only the baby Joash, also known as Jehoash. Joash, Jehoash. Okay, she misses only Joash, who was hidden from her and who replaced her on the throne at the age of seven. But she slaughtered all the others, thought she had them all, and he was taken and hidden. 
Okay, he replaces her on the throne at the age of seven. Second Chronicles 24 says of Athaliah, the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman. So how do you think, how do you think rulership's going now? We have somebody who usurps the throne, slaughtering the royal family. God says that wicked woman, but it says the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God and had also used all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord for the Baals. So we go into the house of God, the, the sons of that wicked woman, and what do we do? We're taking God's things and we're using God's things to worship the Baals. And what did God say? Was it a mystery? Was he unclear? Was it some kind of, you know, I don't really know what he's saying. That's why I read to you over and over. So you're here going, okay, I get it. Please stop. That's why. I wanted you to see it. There's no mystery about it. It was said over and over again. And yet, how are they treating him? What are they doing? How are they living? So you just see, it's, it's a, so we have Athaliah usurps the throne. Her son's that wicked woman. They're using the things in the house of the Lord to serve the Baals. Then Joash, remember, he was the only one who was hidden, so she didn't kill him. Joash, or Jehoash, was installed on the throne around 835 B.C. at the age of seven, and Athaliah is executed at that time. So he gets installed on the throne and he did what was right all the days in which his protector and mentor, the priest Jehoiada, instructed him. So while Jehoiada, the, the priest, was there instructing him and mentoring him, he did what was right during those days. But even then, even when he was doing right under the tutelage of the priest Jehoiada, the high places were not taken away. And 2 Kings 12, 3, you see the people continued making sacrifices and offerings there. So here we have, we have Joash who's being a good king during the time that Jehoiada is alive, mentoring him and instructing him. But even during that time, what are the people doing? Sacrifices, idols. Yeah, yeah. Look at this from God's side, will you? Just look at this from his side. This is, what they're, this is what the people are, are doing. They're just, you know, doing all of these things, all of these sacrifices. You know, they continue doing it. Second Chronicles 24, 17 to 19 says, Now after the death of, of Jehoiada, see, because Jehoiada falters. I mean, I mean, Joash falters after Jehoiada's, the priest Jehoiada's death. So while Jehoiada's alive to instruct him, he's doing well. But after he dies, Joash falters, and you see in 2 Chronicles 24, 17 to 19, it says, Now after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. What was God's response? I could, like I say... They ought to be glad I'm not God. What was God's response? He sends prophets to them. Just like children, he sends prophets to them. And he says to them, listen, you need to come back. You need to come back. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. So here God had told them repeatedly, repeatedly, clearly, clearly, clearly. They just blow him off, treat him like he's a dog. He sends prophets to them. What do they do? They say, come back, come back. God wants you to repent and come. They wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't listen to him. Now Joash, he even sides with the rebels in having Jehoiada's son, his mentor and protector, the priest Jehoiada, Joash sides with the rebels in having, his, in having Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, who had prophesied against the rebels. He sides with them in having, him, having Jehoiada's son put to death in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 22. Now, Joash's son, Amaziah, he reigns from around 796 to 767, so we're in the first half of the 8th century B.C. So he's reigning during that time. 2 Kings 14.3 says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David his father, he did in all things as Joash his father had done. 2 Chronicles 25.14-16 and 16 says, After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods and worshipped them, making offerings to them. Now, how do you think, you think that's going to fly? Is that not directly 
contrary to what God has said over and over again? Of course it is. How could that happen? How could that happen? We can, you know, we can spin a lot of things. Oh, that's old news. Haven't heard from him lately. Uh, however, you see it happening here. He says, so brought the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods, worshipped them, making offerings to them. Therefore, the Lord was angry with Amaziah and sent to him a prophet who said to him, why have you sought the gods of a people who did not deliver their own people from your hand? But as he, the prophet, was speaking, the king said to him, Have we made you a royal counselor? Stop! Why should you be struck down? That doesn't sound very godlike, very submissive. A prophet is delivering the word of God, and the response of the king is what? You better shut up. I'm the king. You're not a royal counselor, and if you keep talking, I'm going to kill you. Right? That doesn't sound very open to God, caring about what God wants. So the prophet stopped but said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. Okay, so Amaziah's son, Azariah, also known as Uzziah, he reigned from around 792 to 740 B.C., Okay, for the first 24 years, he's co-regent with his father. Now, this is where you have to, you know, this is like going into weeds, but, and I'm not going to do that, but he's, he's probably for the first 24 years, he's co-regent with his father. His father was captive for nine years in Samaria, and that may have something to do with it. In 2 Kings 14, 13, you can see that. And for the last 12 years of this lengthy reign, he appears to have been co-regent with his son, Jotham. But anyway, we have this long time, the first party's co-regent, the end he's co-regent. But this lengthy reign of King Uzziah. In 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 2 to 5 says, He was 16 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. So what I want you to see here is you have Uzziah. The verdict on him overall is that Uzziah was a good king. And yet, what are the people doing? We're just worshiping idols, gods. This is what we're doing. Verse 5, 2 Kings 15, verse 5. And the Lord touched the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the household governing the people of Israel. So Jotham comes in at the end as a co-regent. And Jotham is reigning there. Now, the story of, of Uzziah's leprosy is given in, in 2 Chronicles 26, 16 to 19, which says, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Okay, overall, he rates as a good king. But even then, the people, what are they doing? They're continuing to sacrifice and worship idols. But you see here, what's Uzziah doing? He in his pride, he goes in, he's going to offer sacrifices, burn incense. Verse 17 of 2 Chronicles 26, But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now, he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. That's the story of the leprosy that he had. So here you see this king, you see, you know, you would like to see somebody who simply says, listen, no, I'm just, it's all about God. God said, no, I'll never think about doing that. But even with Isaiah, the verdict being a good king, you see what's happening here, and you get to see the story with the leprosy. Now, after Azariah or Uzziah, after Uzziah's death, his son Jotham, who had started reigning with him as a co-regent, he continues to reign down to about 731 B.C. 2 Kings 15, 34, and 35 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. Another verdict of a, this guy's relatively good. What are the people doing? We're just worshiping idols. Not God. 
He told us not to do that. The only worship him. But we're not doing that. Jotham's followed on the throne by Ahaz. 2 Kings 16, 2 and 4. Ahaz, 20 years old when he began to reign, he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering. Oh, you think of that? Think of that. The king of Israel. Israel in the sense of, you know, after they're taken away, sometimes you can refer to Judah as Israel. But here you have this king. What's he doing? He's, he's offering his son as a sacrifice. According to the, he says, offered, even burned his son as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So it looks bad to me. It looks bad. And then we have Ahaz is followed by the good king Hezekiah. He reigns from around 715 B.C. down to 686 roughly. Good king Hezekiah, and it's during his time, 701 B.C., that God miraculously spared Jerusalem from the assault by the Assyrians. Okay, Hezekiah is there, one of the good kings, 701, the Assyrians are at the door. God miraculously spares Jerusalem from, from falling to the Assyrians. 2 Kings 19, 35 and 37, Isaiah 37, 36 through 38, report that an angel struck down 185,000 Assyrians as they were waiting to assault the city. Now, what happens? You see, that's like a great story. That's a great victory. But what happens? Israel turns this great deliverance into something negative. How's that possible? They turned this great deliverance by God into something negative, and that many of them came to think that God would never allow Jerusalem to be conquered because it was his special dwelling place. What did God told them? Over and over, if you treat me like this, the sword's going through the land. You're going to be exiled. You're going to be taken. So he works this miracle in the reign of Hezekiah, kills 185. What do they say? This is safe turf. This is safe turf. God, his special dwelling place is here. He'll never let anything happen to this place. Doesn't matter how we live. No, this is his place. He's not going to let him in his house. You see, he's going he's to protect the house. So he's not going to let him in. We know, that's, we know what happened, right? You see, but this is, how, this is how they wind up. You see, in the words of Jeremiah in chapter 7, verse 11, they came to see the temple as what? A den of robbers. You see, a den of robbers in the sense of a hideout, you see. That's, that's the idea. In the sense of a hideout where the wicked could retreat to safety. That's how they took this. They, they, no, he's going to protect his turf so we can live however we want to live. And we'll be cool here. We'll be safe. Because God will protect his turf as though it has nothing to do with how loyal we are. He'll just protect it because it's the site of his special presence. See, they thought this is somehow some kind of mechanical protection against enemies regardless of how they live. So they turn this great deliverance into something quite negative. Well, Hezekiah... He's followed by the wicked king Manasseh. So we have this good king Hezekiah. You have this deliverance. You have the people there that eventually what happens, they turn that into something negative and that they say, no, it doesn't matter. God's never going to, that's never going to happen. God's never going to allow Jerusalem to be invaded or to fall because that's where he is. Well, what did he say? What did he say? He had said a hundred times. No, no, I'm going I'm to take the place out. If you're this way, I'm going to take it out. Suffering. You're going to be eating your children. Every high wall that you have is going to be, you know, nothing. No, no, he's not going to do it. We see that he delivered, he worked a miracle here. So we have Manasseh. Manasseh reigns from 696 roughly to 642. All right, the first 11 years of this is as co-regent with Hezekiah. But Manasseh is, is a wicked king and and it may be that his co-regency with Hezekiah was prompted by an earlier bout that Hezekiah had with a near-fatal disease. And you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 20, chapter 1, 2 Chronicles uh, 32, 
verse 24, Isaiah 38, 1. But whatever, it looks like he has a, for a period of time, Manasseh and Hezekiah, there's a co-regency there. 2 Kings 21, 1 to 9 says of Manasseh, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed and he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah as Ahab king of Israel had done and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering. And used fortune telling and omens. And dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord. Provoking him in anger in the carved image of Asherah that he had made. He set in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son. In this house and in Jerusalem. Which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. I will put my name forever. And I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander anymore out of the land that I gave to their fathers. If only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them. And according to the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen, and Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. How many times are we going to hear this? What is God doing? He's bearing with them. He's bearing with them as they are treating him in a way he does not deserve to be treated. You see? And he's bearing with them. We serve You know, God is not just bigger than we are. He is so much better than we are. You see? And he's bearing with them. 2 Kings 21 verse 16 adds, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another besides the sin that he made Judah to sin so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So he's religiously, he's what? He's doing all of these things. He's sacrificing his son. He's building altars here. And he's slaughtering innocent people. What is this? It's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. 2 Kings 21, 10 to 15 says, And the Lord said by his servants, the prophets, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all that the Amorites did who were before him and has made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And we think this is, you know, do you hear what God is saying? This is God Almighty who spoke a universe into existence. And he is saying to his people, I'm going to bring on you something that it's going to be so horrible that everyone who hears it, their ears will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria, Just as it happened to the northern kingdom, Samaria with the Assyrians, it's happening to you. I'll stretch over over Jerusalem, the measuring line of Samaria, the plumb line of the house of Ahab, and will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I'm going to take it out. He'll never do that. This is where God dwells. Don't have to worry about that. Peace, peace. When there is no peace. You see, it is a terrible thing to say that to people when what the message ought to be, whoa, we need to repent. (laughs) We need to repent. But there's, "Ah, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be safe. We're good. He says, and I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all all their enemies because they've done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt even to this day. This is, these are tough people. And what has God done? Just born with them. The chronicler, he relates that Manasseh's stubborn refusal to heed the word of the prophets, that led to his being taken to the city of Babylon by the Assyrians. This is an interesting footnote that you see in Chronicles. And it seems that late in his reign, see, he violated his obligations. This is how this worked with vassals when you had a dominant power. We're basically on good terms and kind of 
do what you like and send you money and that kind of stuff. He apparently violated his obligation to the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal and he was taken away in humiliation. Well, according to the chronicler, this led to his repentance and faith and the Lord graciously brought about his return to Jerusalem and restoration to the throne. You see that in 2 Chronicles 33, verses 10 to to 20. So you think, well, how could that happen? Well, from Ashurbanipal's perspective, he apparently brought him into captivity. What happens? He understood that this guy was going to be no problem anymore. So rather than create stuff, we'll let him go back now that he's been whipped and put in line. And so he goes back, and he's he's allowed to go back to his throne. So, uh, you know, he's duly chastened, no longer a problem. Well, what happens? Manasseh's son, he reigns in Judah for two years. Has Manasseh followed this this last-minute kind of repentance of Manasseh? Even though Manasseh's, the verdict on him is he's wicked, horrible. Just did horrible things. What does his son Ammon do? Well, Ammon's terrible. 2 Kings 21, 19 to 24. Ammon's 22 when he begins to reign. Reigned two years. His mother's name was Meshulameth, daughter of Haruz of Jotbah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had done. He walked in all the way in which his father walked and served the idols that his father served and worshipped them. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his fathers, and he did not walk in the way of the Lord. And the servants of Ammon conspired against him and put the king to death in the house. But the people of the land struck down all those who had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, his, his son, king in his place. So he's sitting here. He, he's as bad. Actually, he's worse. What he's doing, Second Chronicles 33 says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh his father had done. Ammon sacrificed all the images that Manasseh his father had made and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But this, but this Ammon incurred guilt more and more. How do you do more and more than Manasseh? Huh? You know, so it's like, it's like it's a nut house as I look at it. It's a religious nut house. They're just going, they're just sitting here living the way they want to live as though God's just up here, total disrespect of God. Absolutely treating him like, who cares what you want? Yeah, yeah, man, nah, I hear you. Bah, bah. Right? Isn't that the attitude? Now you tell me in your spirit, you're telling your child something, your child going, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Bah, bah. Is that disrespectful? Is there something wrong about that? Oh, yeah. There's something very wrong with that. Josiah is eight years old when he begins to reign. He reigns 31 years in Jerusalem. He's a good king. And it's during the 18th year of Josiah's reign that Hilkiah the priest reports finding in the temple what? The book of the law, which is probably the book of Deuteronomy. Finding, he, he find, what do we find here? Well, it looks like this book that had been next to the ark, that this had been, or next to the altar, it says here, that uh, he reports finding is likely the book of Deuteronomy. It had been next to the Ark of the Covenant. You see that in Deuteronomy 31, 26. What probably happens is during the long reign of Manasseh, this evil king, what had happened? Well, it had been taken away. I mean, who wants to have this thing sitting there when the people are just living like that and you have an absolute apostate king? So it was probably taken away and forgotten. Well, Hilkiah finds it and he says, comes over here and he goes... Uh, hey, Josiah, look what we found. When Josiah sees it, can you understand reading the book of the law, reading, if it's right, the book of Deuteronomy, whether you want to think it's the whole law or the book of Deuteronomy, can you see reading what God has said when you know how Israel had lived? Is it any wonder that Josiah ripped his clothes and said, oh, man. See, Josiah believed. You see, he understood. I heard that bell. Thanks. We'll finish next week the journey, and maybe, maybe we'll start, although I think the week after that we'll actually get to the text. 